Thank you. Hello, everyone. Yes, it's working. Okay, so I just want to introduce myself really quickly again. So my name is Ariane van de Ven. I'm a global trans expert at uh, Telefonica Digital. And uh, usually when I introduce myself as a global trans expert, people kind of like wonder what it is that I do. So I'm going to explain to you a little bit uh, what it is that I do before sharing with you my, uh, my research. So first of all, this is really the kind of like objective of my role, is to build a vision about the way people are going to be like in the future. So I don't have any kind of like uh, magic powers or anything like that. Uh, and it's not about knowing exactly what's going to happen in the future, but placing bets about what I think is going to, to happen in the future. That's, that's what my job is about at, uh, at Telefonica. And then the way I do it, and uh, the way I explain what I do, you know, I do trans forecasting. You have people who are trans spotters, you have core hunters, that's a little bit different. My job really is about forecasting trans, thinking about what I think is going to be important in the future. And the way to do it, first of all, is to understand people. And understanding people is not something that's easy, it takes time. Also because uh, within the context of the company I work for, it's all kinds of people. I need to be able to understand old people, young people, uh, wealthy people, poor people, you know, like all kinds of, of different kind of demographics. Uh, and what's very important in order to understand people is to build empathy so that you can have a rapport with those people and you, they really let you into their world. And um, so understanding people is very important. And then once you start understanding people and you have started entering their, their world, it's very important to observe their behaviors. And it's from those observations that you do that you start identifying emerging behaviors, new things that are happening. And that's what transporters are doing a lot of the time. You know, they can tell you, you know, this is this new tribe of people. This is uh, the way people are consuming, you know, like a TV. This is how people are spending their free time. They're very good at spotting those things. So that's part of what I do. But the, the biggest part, actually, of my work beyond spotting things is to try to understand why those things are happening. So I spend a lot of time observing all kinds of behaviors and then trying to identify what are the emotional drivers behind these new behaviors, what are the emotional reasons why people are doing things differently. So, so you will see when I will take you through the, the work that I do, I work a lot with uh, emotion and emotional uh, needs. And then once I have those uh, emotional drivers identified, then I turn uh, all my research into actionable insights for the business. So I'm not just there to share information with people, I'm really here to also help spark uh, innovation ideas. And I sit actually in innovation in um, the Barcelona uh, Innovation Lab of, uh, of Telefonica Digital. So I'm really here as a tool for a lot of people who are within Telefonica. Uh, who are working on the new products, the new services that we're planning for, for the future. And really the objective of uh, my presentation today is to show you how consumer trends can be actually a powerful tool and help you drive your own creativity and your own innovation for your own projects. So hopefully there will be a lot of uh, food for thoughts that I will uh, share with you today. So the, the name of uh, the trend report that I put together this year is the reinvention era. And one thing that's worth explaining is that every year I create uh, a new trans report. And the trends that I identify are trends that are going to be important within the next five years. So it's, it's not so much you know, in, in the long term, so I don't talk about people becoming robots and stuff like that. It's, it's still things that you can see they're starting to happen. It's just I think they're going to become more and more mainstream in, uh, in the future. And, uh, and this is actually the... I'm still, even though I do future stuff, I'm still old-fashioned and I like books, so I actually make a book every year uh, that's shared with uh, all my uh, Telefonica uh, colleagues. And the reason why I called uh, this book this year the reinvention era is because I think in the future it's not going to be so much about inventing new things, it's going to be more about reinventing every single aspect of society. Every single thing as we know them, 
you know, they're there already, but we need to rethink the way they work, why they exist, how can we improve them, how can we make them more sustainable, more accessible to people. So that's why really this, uh, this report is called the reinvention era. And what we're going to see within this context is that because of the wild um, access of uh, digital tools, we're going to see that everybody is going to really become part of this reinvention era and is going to be able to contribute. We're going to see that technology will really enable people to go beyond their mental script and to dream up new opportunities. And recently I was reading some, um, some uh, reports actually about uh, Saudi Arabia, about uh, Korea, about really interesting different places in the world. And it's really interesting to see how technology is really shifting the way people are thinking and therefore reshaping those, those societies. And what we will see also is that we will see more bottom-up and participatory innovation. I think this year I, I did a, a lot of research in, in Africa, in India, and it was really interesting to see all the initiatives that are coming out of those countries to really ensure that there's more and more people participating in this uh, digital society. And, uh, of course, when more and more bottom-up and participatory innovation is, uh, is happening, people are really rethinking all the systems. So they're going to create new political, new economical, and new social uh, systems that are based around completely new values. And within this context of the reinvention era, what I have identified is uh, six uh, trends. And the way I structure my trans research is I work with different dimensions. So the two trends that are at the top are the trends that are related to the individual. So it's really about the way our personal motivations, our personal needs are going to evolve in the future. The, the trends that you see on, the, on this side are more about the collective. How, as a group, as a society, our, our motivations, our aspirations are going to change. And then on the other side is the technological uh, dimension. And it's talking more about how our behaviors and expectations towards uh, technology are going to evolve. So that's the content I'm going to uh, take you through now. And uh, I will start with the first uh, trend, labor of love. And I think it's a trend uh, that probably a lot of you will, uh, will relate to. So this trend, the reason uh, why I started working on this trend was because I was talking with uh, a headhunter in, uh, in Barcelona, and she has a lot of people that come to her who are in their mid-40s, you know, like early 50s, and their job doesn't exist anymore. It's been replaced by an algorithm. And those people feel very uh, useless because they don't know, they've, they've been doing a job, you know, their whole life, and now they, they don't know how to repurpose their, their skills. And uh, she was saying to me, what are we going to do in the future? Because more and more uh, jobs are being automated. So how are people going to change the way they manage their career? So I think there's this happening on one side. I think the other thing that's happening that for me has been a very big um, revelation or had a very big impact in my, uh, in my, in my job is that uh, broad knowledge now is accessible to everyone. So most of the time when I do a presentation and I talk about stuff, people are on their laptop and they're checking what I'm talking about. So if I don't know exactly what I'm talking about, if I haven't researched everything to the, the you know, finest degree, People can always uh, quote me out on it, even though they never thought about this idea before. They had no interest about this specific topic before. So because we have all access to this uh, uh, broad knowledge, being a generalist anymore is not going to be enough for people to compete, in this kind of, to compete and to succeed in this globally connected society. So what we're going to see is people really trying to achieve mastery in a specific field in order to differentiate themselves. And those people are going to thrive to become a specialist. And the specialists are the people who are working passionately and relentlessly 
to achieve mastery in a specific topic, and they engage in what I call a, a labor of love. And this is a really, really big uh, shift because it touches on uh, some subjects that the speaker before me was talking about, this idea of lifelong learning, for instance. Because to become an expert, you are not just somebody who is taking existing knowledge. You, is, you are somebody who is uh, taking the existing knowledge and creating new knowledge out of it. And that's going to be very interesting, I think, for society as a whole, because I think those specialists are going to really push the boundaries of knowledge and come up with new concepts, new ideas, new opportunities for this reinvention um, society that we're all going to, to build together. One of the, the guys that I, I chose to use as one of my examples of a, of a specialist is Jiro Ono. And I picked him because sometimes I realized when I was talking about this trend, people felt I was talking about technologists, scientists, uh, you know, like academics. And of course, a big part of this trend is about those people because within their work, hyper-specialization exists and is very important and that's what their job is about. But uh, I think in the future, we will have all kinds of specialists from all kinds of industries. And Giro is a um, Michelin star uh, sushi chef and um, he's based in Tokyo and he's in his late 80s. You can actually watch a whole documentary about him, which is uh, fascinating. And what I really like about Giro is that he tried to retire when he was in his 60s and he became sick. And he realized that actually it was super important for him in his life to continue improving the way he works. That was really, really connected to his, to his identity. And at 85 or 86, whatever he is right now, uh, he's still finding new ways of improving himself. And he's finding new ways of creating new types of sushis, you know, of, of treating the fish and all those things. So I really think this is really uh, a really big shift in the way we think about knowledge and learning and becoming su successful because we are understanding it more and more as something that's dynamic and that we have to keep working on throughout our lives. And in fact, when you talk to millennials, for a lot of them, it's important, if they're going to work for a company instead of being an entrepreneur, to be in an environment that enables them to keep on learning those subjects uh, that they're very passionate about and to keep improving their, their expertise. So that's the first trend within the individual dimension. The second trend within this uh, personal dimension is the personal odyssey. And the reason how, how I started with this trend was, uh, you know, obviously I looked through a lot of reports to come up with those trends. I tried to really see what's happening with demographics. And one of, one of the things that we've been talking about for a while is the fact that, um, you know, like uh, more and more people in, uh, in their, you know, 20s, 30s, uh, late 30s, are not getting married, they're not taking mortgages, they're not having children. And for a while, a lot of uh, social commentators were talking about these generations are very, as very selfish generations. You know, people don't want to get married and they don't want to have kids because they want to keep on uh, looking after themselves. They're not interested in giving back and all those things. Uh, we've been talking about the boomerang generation and we attributed that uh, to the... Um, the economic crisis, the fact that uh, because now rents are really expensive, it's hard for young people to find work, therefore they have to go back to their, to their parents' home. But I think there's actually a different reason around that, around the fact that uh, you know, people are postponing the time where they decide to commit to lifelong engagement. And I think the reason for that is that, first of all, we know that we are going to live until we're quite old. And we are going to work until we are quite old. Sometimes I say to people, to young people, I say to them, you're going to work until you're 85. And some people look at me in horror, they get really scared. And some people are actually really happy because they like what they do. And, uh, and I think this understanding, you know, this realization that you are going to have this long life uh, is really shifting the way people make decisions. And people want to be able to really know themselves before they commit to lifelong uh, engagements. And I think also because we are in this kind of um, uh, context now where there's a pace of change, where the, the rules of the games are changing all the time, people also want to be able to reassess the direction that their life is taking at different moments of their lives. So we have this new breed of people called explorers 
that are going to engage on this personal odyssey. And the explorers are interesting because they are different from the, um, the specialists in the sense that maybe they haven't found the one thing they're really passionate about and they want to uh, commit their whole life work to. They actually want to accumulate experiences. They want to have different perspectives on things. And they, they're really not afraid of failing. They see failing as an opportunity of, um, of learning. And uh, those people embark on this idea of the personal odyssey to learn more about themselves and the world around them. And those people are not just young people, they're also older people. And an example is this guy, uh, Stephen Zagmeister. He's a really big uh, German designer. And every seven years, he takes a two-year two sabbatical to explore something different, something he doesn't get exposed to in his everyday. And what's interesting is that it's not just people who are on the, on the side of society that are those explorers. Companies are also realizing the value of enabling people to go on this personal odyssey. So we're seeing an increase, for instance, in uh, corporations funding sabbaticals and sabbaticals with a purpose as well. So within this trend, I think it will be very interesting because those individuals are very open-minded and uh, they accumulate a lot of uh, knowledge and experiences. And again, they will be able to contribute to society in a very interesting uh, way. The next trend is the sustainable utopia. So sustainable utopia, now we're moving into how we're going to behave as a group. And I call this trend sustainable utopia for many reasons. But when I started researching this trend, I was thinking one of the things that I found really amazing about uh, digital technology is the transparency that it brings and the fact that it builds your empathy. It's very hard, I think, nowadays to not care about stuff because you see, people, you see people's real conditions, you know? I don't know if you know, there's um, a website called uh, invisiblepeople.tv and uh, this website gives tells the stories of the people who have ended up in the streets. So it's becoming harder and harder for people to think, well, you're in the street because you're a loser, because you, you weren't smart and all those things. You know, people get to really understand how different people from different walks of life end up in uh, situations that are really sad and unfair. So I think because of that, you know, uh, be because digital is bringing more transparency and help is helping us relate to other people, people actually want to positively impact the world around them. And when you ask people, how do you feel when something happens in the rest of the world, 73% of them said that when an event happens in the world, it has an impact in their own community. And I think one of the, the latest examples of this for me, at least in my life, and I'm sure you have uh, your, your own, was during the, the Boston uh, Marathon, during the, just after the bombings, on my Facebook, I had a lot of friends suddenly who were running the next day and they were all saying I'm running for Boston. And it was really interesting because obviously they're my friends, I, I know who they are, a lot of them have no connections with Boston whatsoever. But because you are able to leave those events live, you relate to them and you want to be able to, to do something for them. I really, I am a very optimistic person and I do believe in the, in the good of people. So what we're going to see is more and more people becoming those kind of utopians. And they're not just people, they're also organizations that are trying to create a new kind of society that's based around uh, values of collaboration, or fair, of fairness, for instance, of sustainability. And the utopians are, are very uh, interesting. You have an example here, Patrick Awa. Uh, Patrick Auer is a repat, and we see a lot of those utopians uh, being those repats. So he was very successful in, uh, in the US, um, and then when he had a son, he decided to go back to Ghana, where, he's, uh, where he was born. And uh, he felt a little bit you know, confused because he had such a good life, and then trying to bring up his kid in Ghana, he realized what was the future that his kid was going to have. It was a little bit uncertain. And he felt also that he had a duty as somebody who had a lot of uh, luck and a lot of uh, success in his career to actually give back to the country he came from. So he decided to set up the first uh, American style university in Ghana to help educate the new generation of African leaders. 
And I know other examples of that. Last year, I was in Nigeria at the American University that is also privately funded. And you see more and more of those, um, you know, like repats really going back to their country to try to, um, to have a, a positive uh, impact and create a sustainable change. And the sustainable utopia is not just for the repat. We're also going to see a lot of people within their own community, you know, like trying to challenge the way we live and creating new living systems, you know, trying to bring more sustainability in their, in their environment. And then in parallel to this trend of the sustainable utopia, we have this trend, the intelligent disobedience. And... Um, when I was researching this, uh, this trend, I got all my colleagues in the office a little bit worried because of the materials I was going through and I was getting them to research all kinds of weird things and they thought I was going a bit nuts with this trend. Uh, but I have a quote that I came across that I think uh, represents this, this trend really well. And it says, um, humanity started with an act of disobedience. It's likely it will be terminated by an act of obedience. And I thought uh, it's very true. It's, it's a very, very pertinent, uh, pertinent quote. And the intelligent disobedience is really about that. It really touches on that, that people are realizing that they actually cannot trust the authority. They cannot trust corporations. They cannot trust gov governments. They can't trust uh, institutions. The, the first run report that I did for Telefonica was actually tracking uh, trust. And, uh, and it was incredible. It's been like decreasing steadily, you know, like throughout the, the, the years. And uh, as a result of that, people are realizing that it doesn't serve them well to play by the rules and they're becoming more and more outspoken. And this is something that we see a lot, obviously, with, you know, the Occupy movement. You know, they're a very good example of that, of, of people who are deciding that they are going to be defiant and they are going to stand for alternative solutions. But what really interests me with this, um, with this movement is the fact that people are really turning themselves into solvers. They look at the, at the system and they, they can see the problems, they can spot the problems, and they're thinking in terms of solutions. What are the solutions that I can come up with? And what, again, interests me about those people is that they're not driven by ego. They're really driven by results. They want to, to, to change the way, the way systems work because they have proven to be so unfair. And an example of that is this uh, gentleman on the, on the top, Enric Durand Gérald. He is, uh, uh, so I live in Barcelona, and he is known as the, the Spanish or the Catalan Robin Wood. And the reason why is because uh, in 2007, in Spain, he took over 30 loans and he managed to, uh, to borrow almost half a million euros. And at the time, you could do that without having any collateral. It was like that in Spain. And uh, what he did with the money that he borrowed, he reinvested everything into social activism. And he said, his explanation for his action is that he said, I have robbed from those who robbed us. And he wanted to show that there is a fundamental flaw in the system. And I can tell you, I live in, uh, I live in Spain, and uh, you know, to see people who have their houses taken away from them, sold for nothing, because the banks are corrupted, and they sell the, the, they sell the houses uh, completely undervalued, but then the people still have to pay for the mortgage, the original mortgage of the house, you know, the, the difference in price is horrible. So you can understand that people are like, and we bailed out the banks. So you can <laughs> understand why people are so outspoken about it and why people are not really worried anymore about how they fix things, but they want to fix things for good. And that's one of the things that uh, I found when I was researching this trend is a lot of people using underground uh, tools, you know, like tools and resources that are at the verge of legal to change things and to fix uh, problems. So I spend a lot of time on the deep web, for instance, and a lot of people were saying about me, you know, to me, it's really bad, the deep web. It's like a lot of people say 3D printing is bad because you can print uh, guns, but you can't shoot 
the, 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 the channel is what people do with it. You know, you have good people, you have bad people. It's like, you know, for, for everything. So this trend, I think, of the intelligent disobedience is very, very important because, for instance, for companies like mine, it shows that we have to be extremely transparent and we have to really uh, be honest with, uh, with the people we deal with because people won't stand for it otherwise. People are, are willing to boycott, you know, like uh, Buy Nothing Day uh, last year had like the record participation. And there's more and more uh, groups that are able to, to be formed, you know, like regardless of their location, you know, where people can uh, join each other according to their, you know, based on beliefs and causes that they believe in, you know, obviously thanks to, um, to, to digital. So this one is one that's very uh, dear to me. And then we're going to move into the, the, the technical, uh, the, the, our relationship with, uh, with technology. And I think the, this trend, physical pixels, probably a lot of you uh, are aware of it. You probably went to see the, the guys who are making all kinds of crazy things uh, here that are probably representing very well this, uh, this trend. But physical pixel is, is interesting. For me, I always take the side of technology. I always think that technology is something that is democratizing the world, that is uh, really helping more and more people engage with society. I, I do think it's incredible, the, the power of technology. And when I started working for Telefonica um, over four years ago, people started saying to me, Ariane, you have to be a little bit careful when you talk about technology. You know, you have all those you know, uh, uh, people who are spending all their lives on, on the virtual worlds, they have no real life, you know, you need to balance, you know, like your, um, your, your, your speech, you know, your, your point of view when you talk with people, because there's a lot of negative things happening out of technology. People are not feeling close to each other anymore and all that stuff, and which I didn't agree with anyway. I think somebody who is uh, very social on Facebook is very unlikely to be very unsocial in real life. I mean, th those things don't really... Uh, really happen uh, in, in reality. But anyway, so when I was working on this trend, what I found uh, really interesting is that I never think that technology changes us despite ourselves. I think when we change our behavior, it's because, it's because technology is fulfilling uh, a need, and that's why we are changing our, our behavior. And with this trend, what I wanted to say is that as we are able to do more and more things in a virtual way, in a digital way, to have all those digital experiences, the physical is actually becoming more and more important for people. And we have this kind of like renaissance of the, of the object and this renewed interest for the physical over the digital. And then the other thing that we're seeing is that our interaction with uh, technology is also changing. People want more tangibility, more embodied interaction with technology. And so this one, Physical Pixel, talks about that. And I talk about the people who are the makers. So the, the makers are people who have those digital dreams, and they really harness all the means of self-production that are available to them, all the digital tools that are available to them to actually create physical objects. And uh, I'm sure you, you I mean, if, if you are interested in this, that you have read uh, Chris, uh, Chris Anderson's book, you know, uh, um, where he talks about the long tail of things. I think his book is actually called Makers, so I didn't invent anything. I reinvented <laughs> what it means. Um, but this is very interesting because it's really, really changing the, the way we are engaging with technology and it's also really completely changing the way we produce things, we create things. And so I think this trend will be more and more uh, important in the future. And then the last trend that I will share with you is uh, called Enriched Reality. And uh, when I was looking at, uh, at this trend, when I was doing some research, I was doing a lot of research about technology that enhances our senses and, and you know, like, um, like robots that can, that can, you know, like work with us, you know, like help us, you know, like enhance our performance and all those things and monitoring and tracking technology. Those were kind of like the, the themes I was looking into. Um, and then I came across this, uh, this book that was talking about uh, human perception. And it explained that basically, as, as human beings, and it's very obvious, all, all of you probably uh, are aware of that, 
But as, as human beings, we, we perceive things, but we only have a limited perception. So if you compare us with like animals, animals can perceive, you know, like smells that we can't perceive, uh, colors, you know, like different, different things. And currently, the perception that we have is enough to help us navigate the human ecosystem. But what I think is going to happen uh, more and more in the future is that our ecosystem is being populated by all those um, devices that are connected to us, that are monitoring and tracking what we're doing. And we are not able, just on our own, to be able to perceive everything that is going on in this ecosystem that is either, uh, ever evolving. So I think there's going to be a need to, uh, to actually create um, new principles around that, to really enable people to have access to an enhanced perception of themselves and of the world around them. So enriched reality, uh, you know, I took this example of Neil Harbison, who's a bit of an extreme uh, example. You know, he's got an eyeborg because he cannot see, uh, you know, like he just sees in, uh, you know, he's Daltonian, I think. So with this, he can see. Uh, more and more colors, but I think we're going to see more and more examples of of, uh, of cyborg-y uh, type things happening. And one of the things that I saw also was the, the use of uh, robots, which are going to be a lot more customizable, you know, with more bots, so that they can really answer to our specific needs. And another thing that I think will, will happen within this idea of the enriched reality is that more and more technology will just run in the back and will kind of like anticipate what we what we need and and do it for us so i think this this trend will be uh will, will you know like will manifest itself probably a little bit more you know in the future than the other trend that i i shared with you but as you can see i put the google glasses here because it's not that far either so those are the the six uh, trends that uh, i wanted to to share with you uh you know today so three dimensions, the individual dimension, the collective dimension, and then the, the technological uh, dimension. And then I wanted to explain with you really what, what are we doing with, uh, with those trends at, uh, at Telefonica, because it's not just about you know, gathering a lot of insights, but what do we actually do with it? So within Telefonica, I share this work with all the, the whole of Telefonica, actually not just Telefonica Digital, but also the different uh, the different OBs. And we do some presentations like this, but we also do a lot of workshops. So for instance, from these trends, which are big society trends, we then try to understand how is this going to impact video? Because we have video products and services. So for instance, the, the fact that, uh, that people are going to become uh, want to become specialists. How is that going to, uh, to change video? Well, we're going to have more and more of a long tail of content and of very, very niche content that's going to be very difficult to monetize because, you know, it's, it's hard to buy content and then monetize it when you have the long tail. So how could we come up with an innovation that answered its, this human need that people will have within this, uh, this video context. So an example of doing that could be, for instance, to enable people to crowdsource or to crowdfund, rather, to crowdfund uh, content that they're interested in. So I could, I could have a, a, a profile, for instance, that is open. And you can see all the kind of, um, of uh, content that I, I am interested in. And this content will be mapped, uh, not the traditional way, not just according to genres, but it could be, you know, like um, actors, plots, you know, subjects, all kinds of different things. And then I could see other people that match uh, my, my test graph, if you want. And then we could connect together and then decide, you know what? I really want to see uh, this, uh, this, this movie, I want to have access to this documentary, and then start a fundraising uh, you know, initiative. So that could be one way, for instance, that instead of trying to combat you know, piracy, which is, by the way, not something that people do because they want to be pirates, a lot of the time is because they don't have access to the content that they want to view legally. That's why they, they, they use piracy. So that could be, for instance, one way that we go from like a, a very big macro trend, okay, people becoming more specialized, wanting to get access to more specialized content, to actually coming up with an innovation which is about helping people crowdfund 
niche content. So that's, that's one example. The other thing that we do in terms of uh, innovation within uh, Telefonica is that we really try to engage people and make them think in terms of solvers. You know, what are the problems that we're trying to, to solve? So within the, the company, we have an open innovation program, which is open to everyone. So you can be an intern, can be receptionist, whoever in whatever part of uh, Telefonica digital, and you can submit an idea. And uh, your, your idea goes through a committee, and the committee changes all the time, so that you, you can't influence people. You don't know who's going to be reviewing your, um, your proposal. And then uh, you have several rounds. And then once uh, your idea is, uh, is uh, you know, accepted, and we select a few ideas you know, per uh, round of, uh, of innovation calls, uh, then you get a team together and you work very much like a startup. So we have a very, very lean approach within the company to really create uh, fast innovation. And uh, from a trans perspective, you know, I help people uh, shape their, uh, their innovation proposals to make sure it's really rooted in real um, uh, consumer insights and consumer you know, needs, like real needs that I think people will have in the future. Because there's always... Um, you know, a tendency when, when you get very excited about technology to focus very much on the technology and then forget, yes, but in the end, uh, who's going to be using it? And it can't be everyone. You need to really have a, a picture of a, of a person, you know, like uh, wh when you are working on your, uh, your innovation. And that's why for this, you know, this trend report, I don't just have trends, I have also those typologies that I, talk you, that, that I took you through to really help people use that within their own, um, you know, like um, innovation uh, projects. So I, um, that, that's kind of uh, it <laughs> in terms of uh, what I wanted to share with you today. So I have a lot of time for questions if, uh, if you want to ask me some questions. Thank you very much, Ariane. You're welcome. So who would like to ask Ariane a question? <laughs> I think there's there are so many interesting ideas that you presented <laughs> and you. a lot of information. So, yeah. I went fast. That's right. Um, <coughs> yeah, thank you for the presentation. It was great. Um, I'm Greg. Uh, I think it's it's really interesting for your the trends that you you put out. Could could you come back to it? Could you come back to the slide? Sorry? The, the slide. Yeah. Um, Sorry. With all your trends, yeah. That one. The last one. Um, like, from mastery, exploration, all the trends that you're giving out, um, mm -hmm. do you think that actually the root of it um, could be like uh, finding a purpose? Like, people are now looking for to realize themselves? Mm -hmm. Um, I think our grandparents, like, they needed to work to survive, where our parents, they needed to work to pay for our education, and now our generation, the coming generation, mm -hmm. um, when we're looking for, okay, for a, a job or a work, we're looking to realize ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I think from everything that you've been um, presenting, it's like people are... If they're going for a sus sustainable, you know, um, a job or this kind of branch, mm -hmm. it's 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 all to find a way to to give a purpose to to their life. You see yeah. what I mean? No, no, absolutely. I think the yes, finding a sense of uh, purpose is I think something that uh, you know everybody is trying to to do, and it's uh, it's something that's also it's not just a generational thing. It's something that culturally I is very different. Okay. So uh, like. Um, a couple of months ago, I was on an innovation trip in the Nordics. And uh, that's something that I found really incredible because I was meeting a lot of entrepreneurs there, a lot of uh, startups, and no one was talking to me about their success in terms of financial success. No one, just one guy that I met that out of 65 people that I met. Uh, everybody else was talking to me about the problem they're trying to solve or the thing they're really passionate about that they want to give access to more people. And that was really interesting. And what I found, for instance, in the Nordic is that people have a very strong sense of individual purpose. So they need to accomplish something for themselves. 
but with a very strong uh, sense of duty for the collective. So th it's not enough to be financially successful or you know for yourself. You really have to give back to to um, to the collective, and I think maybe that's also why. Um, that's also why they're quite happy there, you know, even though they have things with the weather and like suicide rate and stuff. I think overall they're quite, <laughs> they're quite happy. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> you have another question here? Oh, uh, thanks. Thanks for a great talk, and also for, uh, especially for the presentation, which is uh, which got nice design. I, Thank I, you. It's not me. It's my my former intern. He's gone. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know. I cry every day. I'm like, oh. but, but it's great. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, uh, I think uh, this uh, vision or um, is uh, more like for our society, mm -hmm. like um, uh, like uh, Europe and uh, North. Uh, America, um, uh, and I, I wonder uh, if, uh, like, uh, what's the vision for like developing countries, mm. and uh, maybe, uh, like, if the gap between those two worlds mm -hmm. were uh, like uh, be smaller or greater, because I think maybe w we will like uh, mm. be somewhere else when uh, mm. they are on, on this level, or if they could. <coughs> So it's very interesting because the, so the research that I do to make sure it's used by my colleagues, I need to make sure it's not just Eurocentric and we're not in the US really. So I have to make sure it's, it's relevant you know, to the Latin American markets and also within innovation, we could, we could take some of our innovations in Africa, in India, you know, wherever. So I have a story <laughs> for each of the, each of the trends. But for instance, the physical pixel one is something that's really going to change, I think, uh, Africa. That's going to be a massive enabler for them. And you're seeing that in Africa, they're actually really uh, embracing this whole 3D printing stuff. You know, they have Mecca Fair there. Because also it's very hard for, for us, you know, like European people, to guess the kind of things that they would need. And this, uh, this whole 3D technology, uh, printing technology, is going to enable them to make things for themselves. And I think within the trend, the uh, intelligent disobedience, I actually think that people from developing countries will have, a, will have an edge on, on us. Because, um, and this is interesting because I was a bit torn when I was in the Nordics, because I was thinking they, they have very little problems, and that's why they, they're able to think in terms of possibilities. But I also think that when you have grown up in an environment that's very confined, it forces, it forces some people, not all, to be very creative and very ingenious. And uh, in, in, the, in the actual book where I have a lot more content, I talk about uh, Cubans and how they, they are being uh, uh, tech disobedient because they have to repurpose everything and they've had to do that since the 50s because they can't, you know, the embargo, blah, blah, blah. So they, they have been incredibly uh, ingenious and I think a lot of their ingenuity is something that we can learn from. So I actually think there is, going to be, uh, there is going to be a shift and I think some of the best innovations are not going to come from the US or Europe. I think it's going to come from other places, children as well. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Hi, so really as a follow-up to that question then, how do you see the um, international transfer mm. um, you know, retrospectively and you know, going forward of those mm. cross-cultural you know, ingenuity mm. from Cuba and how does yeah. that inform business strategy in Europe, for example? Yeah. But so it's, it's very interesting because, um, so for instance, when I was researching Sustainable Utopia, uh, I was looking at initiatives that are done, uh, you know, by, like by the, the repats and people who want to create new systems and stuff. And I found those guys, um, I think they're in India, they have this network called the Honeybee Network. And their job is to make sure that tribal knowledge doesn't disappear. Because we, again, because we're the Google bubble people, we think we know everything. <laughs> because, it's, because we know what's on Google, but what's on Google is tiny and I'm sure I mean, I know you know that, you know. Um, and so I think that's something that is starting to happen and will happen more and more, is that we're going to realize that what we think we know is the knowledge is actually very small and we have a lot, a lot, a lot of other knowledge to learn from those, uh, from those countries. And the misconceptions, you know, I work for quite a, you know international company and uh, two years ago, 
we did some research in, uh, in Colombia and in uh, Brazil in favelas. And the idea was to try to understand how technology could help um, low-income women, but like uh, class E, you know, like really quite, uh, they live in favelas. And everybody assumed that uh, they would never have a phone, you know, like they would be those poor ladies from like the Middle Ages, whatever. And uh, we went to the favelas and uh, all of them had a phone. Most of them had a smartphone. Of course, they weren't using it, you know, like as much as we are using it, but they, they, they were totally connected. And the, the mobile phone was actually the, um, the, their most personal and treasured object because it was often the only uh, object that they had only for themselves. Uh, so I think this international transfer is something that has going to have to happen because all the companies need to be global now. So we need to be close you know, to people, understand people, and stop thinking that, you know, because we are where we are, we can just sell things to the rest of the world in the same way. So, big power shift. Mm. Um, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of listened to all of them, I was a little bit late, but I need two narratives to understand is how mm -hmm. everything is changing w with respect to our perception of money. Mm -hmm. And how also what's a trend in terms of our perception of time, mm -hmm. our time. I yeah. mean, I, so yeah. if you could give us a little mm. narrative. Yes. So money, I think uh, that's something in, in all the, the reports I've been uh, doing for Telefonica. It was very clear that our perception towards money is changing. Obviously, there's differences in different markets, you know, they, they, with also with um, demographics and stuff. But overall, I think it's clear that people don't define success just uh, as financial success. That's, I think, very clear. And that's changing, therefore, the decisions that we are making, you know, as, uh, as people. So the, the career that you decide to take uh, for companies like mine, for instance, is very, uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge, you know, like how do you deal with people who are, you know, 24, 25, who don't see their work as their life, <laughs> you know, and who are very engaged with other things outside work. You know, that's a very different way of like, um, you know, attracting those people and, you know, making them feel that they can realize uh, themselves in the, the working environment uh, we're in. In terms of time, I think, uh, so time is something, again, uh, also I, I ask myself a lot of questions about time. And last year in uh, my report, I had a trend called staccato culture. So if you do music, staccato means acceleration, yeah. So, uh, so and that's something that everybody talks about. Yeah, we, we like uh, headless chicken, we're doing things so fast, we're becoming so imp impatient, blah, blah, blah. And I think yes and no, yes. But, you know, we are doing that at, at some uh, moments. I am extremely impatient person, but because I have a mobile phone actually, it's, it's made me a lot more patient. Or it's making me not get pissed off when I have to wait because I can maximize uh, my time. Uh, and I think more and more because of technology, actually, we can decide where we want to, to take time uh, and for what. Uh, so, for instance, you know, I can work anywhere pretty much, you know, like, uh, and I work in different uh, time zones with different teams and stuff. It doesn't matter if I'm in the office, if it's a weekend, it's uh, whatever. And then when I want to take time off, to do something else, I do that as well. And I think more and more people want to work in this way, in this more, you know, like a uh, flexible uh, kind of way. And I don't know if you've read uh, the book from uh, Jaron Lanier, who owns the future, but he's got a, he's amazing, like really amazing uh, um, guy, thinker. And uh, he, uh, he, he talks also about, uh, about uh, time and the fact that we need to learn to stop feeling the pressure of time. And to, I guess, so his example is a, also a personal example that I have. Everybody f for the past four years are on my back because I don't use my Twitter account. I've never sent one tweet. And everybody thinks it's crazy. It's like, you're a trans person, you know, you should be, you know, tweeting all the things you're thinking, blah, blah, blah. And to me, it's like brain dump. You know, I'm someone, I'm actually, I'm not that smart. It takes me a lot of time to come up with a good idea. And it's not something I can do on Twitter. You know, I do a book every year. Like, I write everything myself. It, it takes time. And people know it takes nine months, so I joke. This is baby number five. <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's very important for me, and I resist that. You know, people want me to 
to, uh, to send them reports and blah, 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 way more often than I do, but I don't do it. And I think people have to learn to, to do that as well, you know, to appreciate that it takes time to, to formulate a thought, you know. So I think those things are, are, are shifting, but it's, it's, I, don't have a, I don't have an answer to the question of, uh, of time, but it's, it's a subject I think that's very interesting to, to monitor. Thank you very much. Do we have any more questions? <laughs> Same people? <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, then. Uh, I was asking about time in another mm. context, in the concept oh, okay. of, um, first of all, our lives become a to-do list. We have mm -hmm. to do that and fill every single second with, mm -hmm. with our iPhone. And it has to do with also the attention, our capacity mm -hmm. to focus on something for more than a few seconds. Mm -hmm. How all technology and our lives are changing that. Mm. That's our concept of time. But I have another question. Yeah, okay. The concept of, I mean, because I'm not <laughs> an expert on this, but, uh, you know, in the in internet, now the, one of the big names, there are many, it's gamification. Mm -hmm. So the concept of fun, how mm -hmm. leisure or fun is affecting in these new trends. So yeah. if you have anything to say? Uh. Yeah, 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 so uh, again, uh, I, had, uh, I had several trends that were, um, that were talking about that. And actually in the report, uh, in the personal odyssey, I, I, I talk uh, more about that. Um, Yes, uh, gamification is a great way of, of learning things, of changing people's behavior in a way that's, uh, that's playful. It's something that can be applied to all kinds of uh, areas, you know, like especially w some of the examples I really like were around uh, health. So uh, an example I saw a few years ago uh, when I was uh, looking at that, at this idea of uh, playfulness, was um, a hospital that was using Guitar Hero to help amputees learn how to work with their new, uh, their new body parts. And that I thought was really, you know, was, uh, was really good. I think hospitals, I was at the hospital actually in uh, July, and I can tell you they need a lot of gamification because they're really like, not f dreadful uh, places and it's very important for people to feel better, to, um, you know, uh, playfulness can help them feel better, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, I think it's also something that uh, can help, you know, like motivate people in the workplace as well, you know, and uh, also with this idea of like changing behavior. Like, for instance, we have this recycling thing at work and it's like nobody knows how to use it. I'm sure if we could come up with a game around it, more people would be recycling. And I think education, the, the talk before me was about education. And that's a subject I'm very, very uh, interested in. And I went to Finland, actually, to talk to people who are working in education and understand how they're working in the system. And I think, uh, yeah, gamification is a really uh, great way to help rethink uh, education. Because it's clear it's not working the, the old way anymore. So, I yeah. have another <laughs> question here. Thanks. Um. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, I was just wondering about the labor of love point. How the what, sorry? The labor of love? Yes. How do you think education is going to change? Education. Yeah, yeah. How, how do you think it will change? So I think education is going to change. So one of the things I really like about labor of love is that um, I think it's going to be ultimately the democratization of the elite. Because of, I uh, don't know if you remember when I was talking about this trend, I was saying for those people, those specialists, it's not enough just to take the knowledge. So, you know, I can go to uh, Harvard and take the knowledge that I'm given, but if I don't create any new knowledge out of what I've been given, I will never become a specialist. I will just be like the 50 or 100 or 200 people that have gone through the same course. And also this idea of knowledge being something that's dynamic is something that's really impacting uh, that, that's going to have to impact, uh, you, you know, like uh, education. And that, that is very interesting because if knowledge is dynamic and is becoming more and more specialized, how do you present it to people? So we actually have a, an innovation that we're working on internally that, that, that was trying to think about this problem for chefs, you know, because chefs have very, very, very specific uh, knowledge uh, that they need to work with to make food. And it's about texture, it's about smells, it's about chemical process, like all of this, it's incredible. And uh, we are cr trying to create a digital taxonomy of knowledge, and knowledge that is not just established knowledge, but that is also knowledge that is based on wisdom. 
You know, so that's we we don't have it yet. <laughs> it's called Bullypedia. Uh, we're doing that in par partnership with um, the El Bui uh, Foundation, uh, but we we're looking at it, and I think it's I think it's great because also you have all the you know uh, online uh, you know the massive online courses that people can access and stuff. So that's great. That's a really good basis. But I think what we need to educate with is tools for people to be able to think for themselves. I think is the and it's 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 hard. Thank you very much, Ariane. Thank you. We'll have Thanks. to stop here, but thank you all very much for your participation.